Welcome to chapter 3 of Things Fall Apart. In this chapter you're going to learn uh, more background information about Unoka, Akonko's father. Uh, you're going to learn about his death. Uh, you'll learn about some of the Igbo spirituality and religion and some of the gods that they worship. Also you'll learn more about their customs which is going to be something that carries throughout the entire novel. You'll learn about the concept of chi, which they consider their personal god. I like to think of it as their inner spirit or their soul. And I had a student one time that considered it as their mojo, which I thought was pretty neat. Um, it's also going to show you how the Igbo interact socially with one another, or how they used to interact socially um, when the novel was set, you know, again in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, it has a couple of proverbs in this chapter as well that I want you to pay close attention to. And you'll remember that they call proverbs the palm oil with which words are eaten. So you know they're definitely important to the Igbo, and they're going to be important in my class. And they also introduce you to the concept of seed yams. And I don't want you to be confused and think that there's some sort of seed. It's just the yam itself. Um, the yams don't produce seeds. The yams produce other yams and they put the yam in the ground and then it grows a tendril from the yam and as the tendril grows up the yams grow under the ground. Okay, So don't be confused by that when you hear seed yams. It's just another yam that they're going to plant into the ground. So let's get started with chapter 3. Okonkwo did not have the start in life with... Let's get started with chapter 3. Okonkwo did not have the start in life which many young men usually had. He did not inherit a barn from his father. There was no barn to inherit. The story was told in Umuafia of how his father, Unoka, had gone to consult the oracle of the hills and caves to find out why he always had a miserable harvest. The oracle was called Igbala, and people came from far and near to consult it. They came when misfortune dogged their steps, or when they had a dispute with their neighbors. They came to discover what the future held for them, or to consult the spirits of their departed fathers. The way into the shrine was a round hole at the side of a hill, just a little bigger than the round opening into a hen house. Worshippers and those who came to seek knowledge from the god crawled on their belly through the hole and found themselves in a dark, endless space in the presence of Agbala. No one had ever beheld Agbala except his priestess, but no one who had ever crawled into his awful shrine had come out without the fear of his power. His priestess stood by the sacred fire which she built in the heart of the cave and proclaimed the will of the god. The fire did not burn with a flame. The glowing logs only served to light up vaguely the dark figure of the priestess which would add to the creepiness of the cave, which inspires the fear. Sometimes a man came to consult the spirit of his dead father or relative. It was said that when such a spirit appeared, the man saw it vaguely in the darkness, but never heard its voice. Some people even said that they heard the spirits flying and flapping their wings against the roof of the cave. And so we can already tell that those are not spirits flying and flapping around the cave, they're bats. Many years ago, when Akankwo was still a boy, his father, Unoka, had gone to consult Agbala. The priestess in those days was a woman called Chika. She was full of the power of her god, and she was greatly feared. Unoka stood before her and began his story. Every year, he said sadly, before I put any crop in the earth, I sacrifice a cock to Ani, the owner of all land. It is the law of our fathers. I also kill a cock at the shrine of Ephigioku, the god of yams. I clear the bush and set fire to it when it is dry. I sow the yams when the first rain has fallen, and stake them when the young tendrils appear. I weed... Hold your peace! screamed the priestess, her voice terrible as it echoed through the dark void. You have offended neither the gods nor your fathers. When a man is at peace with his gods and his ancestors, his harvest will be good or bad according to the strength of his arm. You, Unoka, are known in all the clan for the weakness of your machete and your hoe.
When your neighbors go out with their axe to cut down virgin forests, you sow your yams on exhausted farms that take no labor to clear. They cross seven rivers to make their farms. You stay at home and offer sacrifices to a reluctant soil. Go home and work like a man. Unoka was an ill-fated man. He had a bad chi or personal god. An evil fortune followed him to the grave, or rather to his death, for he had no grave. He died of the swelling, which was an abomination to the earth goddess. When a man was afflicted with swelling in the stomach and the limbs, he was not allowed to die in the house. He was carried to the evil forest and left there to die. There was the story of a very stubborn man who staggered back to his house and had to be carried again to the forest and tied to a tree. The sickness was an abomination to the earth, and so the victim could not be buried in her bowels. He died and rotted away above the earth and was not given the first or the second burial. Such was Unoka's fate. When they carried him away, he took with him his flute. Now, I don't know what the sickness is that has killed Unoka, um, but I get the idea of why they're not burying him. See, they understand that something is wrong with him, and they're afraid that if they put his body in the ground, he'll contaminate the soil. And they're literally living from year to year off of the yams, which they pull out of the soil. So it makes sense that they wouldn't want to put something they felt was diseased into the soil where they're getting their food. With a father like Unoka, Okonkwo did not have the start in life which many young men had. He neither inherited a barn nor a title, nor even a young wife. Imagine that, inheriting a wife. It's kind of weird. But in spite of these disadvantages, he had begun, even in his father's lifetime, to lay the foundations of a prosperous future. It was slow and painful, but he threw himself into it like one possessed. And indeed, he was possessed by the fear of his father's contemptible life and shameful death. And again and again, you'll see that Akankwo is desperately trying to be the opposite of his father. 